be integrated to all of the aspects of an application developer's life cycle, uh, both from the team coordination and source control management perspectives to accessing the, the mainframe in terms of running work. Um, integrating with our debug tools so that you can not only write and, and compile your code, but you can interactively debug it. Um, we also have a close integration with our what used to be known as the Rational Developer for System Z unit test feature is now a standalone product known as Rational Development and Test Environment for System Z. And that Z environment sitting on an x86 Linux engine is a powerful new addition to the developer who is challenged with being able to unit test their work and function test their work in a ZOS environment. Um, enough said about the, the, the role that as an uh, rational developer for System Z serves. Yes, I used to be the asset analyzer product manager, so some of that speak crawls back into my words. Let's look at the next slide. With 8.5, and since it is past the 29th of May, this slide is not IBM confidential. Uh, Saeed, if you want me, I can fix the PDF and send it to you without those red words on it. Sure. We, in, on the 29th of May, just before Innovate, we announced the latest release of Rational Developer for System Z. Um, we have continued to improve the integrations we have with our comprehensive lifecycle management solutions, including Team Concert, our DNT. Uh, we have done some rather interesting things with our application quality and structural analysis capabilities that are now native into Rational Developer for System Z. These complement the enterprise-wide capabilities that Asset Analyzer provides. Um, we've done some packaging and licensing simplification, and I'll show you what that means. Uh, we continue, as always, to um, address critical client needs and requirements in each and every one of our releases. I believe at last count there's somewhere between 30 and 40 RFEs that have been integrated into version 8.5. And one of the other things that, that as you look in the details of 8.5, you'll realize there's been some language equity work going on. Not only do we have excellent and improved support for COBOL, but now we've taken a number of steps to bring our PL1 support into equity, into capability equity, into on par with our COBOL support. And this is an ongoing uh, exercise that we have to make sure that all of the languages are properly managed. Um, let me think. What I want to mention here is from a team concert source code, code management perspective, we now offer remote syslib support when you're in local project mode. Now, when you're, when you're in local project mode, that means you're doing the development work on your workstation, and that's where the source lies. This is the most MSU efficient way of doing things and the, and the, the recommended approach in our integrated solution. But there was always that challenge of, well, what about the syslib files that I'm not touching but I need? All right, do I have to move everything down? And so with 8.5, we've made a significant change that says, for the stuff that you're not changing but you need to touch or access as syslibs, they can, in fact, remain remote on your mainframe. And so this really adds a lot of value to the local project support. Um, so you can just move down the bits that you need to change and work with and leave the rest up on the mainframe. We also added some significant analysis enhancements. Um, uh, there's, it's really more than eye candy here. There were some capabilities that uh, developers liked in Asset Analyzer in terms of product structure being shown graphically and in information about the data elements and other such things that we wanted to make native to RDZ. We didn't take them out of Asset Analyzer. That has a enterprise role. So for RDZ, what we've done is we've allowed the individual developer to have that kind of analysis capability on the items that they're working and changing, giving them Dojo widget-based graphic access to the stuff that they're actually working on. Uh, we've also done some rather interesting things in terms of code governance. Um, we see that the ind integrated development environment, that is Rational Developer for System Z, is in fact a critical on-ramp 
to the integrated solution, the integrated life cycle management solution. Um, and so we needed to make sure that we did some packaging work to make it more accessible to the individual developers, particularly those who only want to or need to work with DOS uh, and don't have a broader need. But we're still meeting both of those requirements. Uh, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. One of the more interesting things that we did uh, from a testing perspective, other than taking unit test and making its own product, is uh, for those of you familiar with the J unit capabilities, uh, we're creating Z unit. And so in 8.5, what we've done is put in place the framework to do unit test specification and management and execution for ZOS environments using the J unit, X unit models that are already out there. Now I will warn you that Z unit is not at the functional level of J unit, but that is the direction that we're taking and what you'll see in 8.5 is a significant first step in that space. From a code coverage and code governance perspective, we did some very interesting thing. Code coverage is what have I touched when I've been unit testing and we now allow you to go down to the line level and show you graphically which lines you've touched and which lines you haven't, and allow you to manage the, the threshold reporting of that capability. So you have a feel as an individual developer how much I still have to do or how much I have done. From a code review perspective, uh, significant changes here. We've, we, let, we opened that door in 803, where we had COBOL-based rules that you could run against your source to say, am I following my company's coding guidelines or am I in violation of them? Well, we've added significantly new numbers of those rules for COBOL, some 40 or more additional ones that are coming from client feedback as I really think you should have this kind of a rule. We added a set of rules for PL1 programs. Uh, and uh, perhaps the, the, the most interesting thing here is that we've opened up a customer specifiable framework for writing your own COBOL rules. These are essentially Java plugins. Uh, we have the full COBOL um, API defined, so you can literally write rules against anything that you can write in COBOL. Um, this is uh, a requirement that a number of our clients have asked for. It says, IBM, you've got, you've got a nice set of rules there, but there's always going to be rules that the rest of the, the universe doesn't care about, but we do. And so this provides you, from a COBOL perspective, the opportunity to add to your rules so that you can look for the things you're looking at. And from an application analysis perspective, you can see a little eye candy in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, that is the Dojo widget. Any of those uh, boxes, if you click on them, will take you to that element in the source editor so that you can use that to navigate through your code uh, and also you can print it as a bitmap, something that the asset analyzer folks haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, we have now the capability to identify and highlight potentially unreachable code. You may have heard of this as dead code analysis. Um, so we've put um, as part of our real-time syntax checking capabilities, we have now have the capability of figuring out, hey, this section of COBOL code, nothing touches, nothing reaches. And this is from a static analysis perspective. It's the sort of thing that developers want to know when they realize, oh, well, I did all these changes, oops, I have a chunk of code now I can't reach. Right? And, that, and it's potentially unreachable. It's static analysis, not gospel, but it at least gets you headed in the right direction. We added a data element table so you can see for the program that you're in, uh, be it COBOL or PL1, and its dependent copy books or include files, the data elements, where are they defined, whether they're read-write. So as the developer, you can see, oh, here is where my IOs are going. Right? Um, that's the highlights for that one. I'm, I'm conscious of the time I have. I've already covered this slide, which is great. Packaging. Um, prior to 8.5, we had four packages. Uh, we had a Japanese-only package. We won't discuss that any further, but if there are questions on that, I can answer them. 
we had rational developer for System Z with EGL, which was a bundle of RDZ and RBD, rational business developer. We had rational developer with Java, which was a bundle of RDZ and RAD. And we had rational developer for the enterprise, which was a bundle of RDZ, RAD, rational business developer, and the Power AIX tools, not the I tools because this was designed to allow you to write applications that you could drive either to the main System Z machine or the ZBX blades that are now associated with the Z Enterprise class server. Um, with 8.5, we've unbundled RDZ, so those folks who are only working on ZOS development, COBOL, PL1, Assembler, Submit JCL, that's what you do, and basic Java, this is a, an excellent offering for you. It's smaller, leaner, only has ZOS connections, and is really focused on that development experience. If you have broader needs, J2EE needs, EGL needs, or AIX needs, then there is the Z Enterprise product, which we had in place already. All of these are now at the 8.5 level. We did ship an 8.5 RAD. We did ship an 8.5 RBD, and obviously an 8.5 RDZ and an 8.5 rational developer for power. Okay. And they all shell share. You can individually install them as you need. So what we have is a comprehensive multi-platform IDE solution shaped to the way you need it, now at a new level of capability with some really interesting stuff for you to look at. Saeed, you want to take it back, or do I have to give it back to you? Excellent. Thanks a lot, Rich. Uh, now I will give the controls to Juzer who will do that uh, detailed technical presentation on RDZ, as well as like he is going to show you a live demo after the presentation. Okay? So I'm, those are, I'm making you as a presenter. Take the control. Okay, hello everyone. This is Juzer. And also like uh, I have made everyone, I mean like you know, I muted the lines. If you have any questions like there is a chat option at the bottom, you can, I mean, like, you know, uh, write down all your questions so that we can answer one by one. Thanks, everyone. Yep. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Richard. Um, Richard has um, almost covered uh, basics as well for RDZ, so I'll be giving an overview of the features, main features that RDZ has. Um, first of all, let's just do a quick look at some of the challenges that uh, you know managers uh, managers are facing these days. That you know they're concerned about their budget, like uh, they they want to maintain and enhance even enhance their existing applications, but how to control their budget and uh, you know um, the redevelopment of applications, you know how to control them and how to reduce number of defects and how to improve the quality and you know uh, and the, the productivity of the developers and and the increasing number of uh, distributed, you know, applications, you know, how to maintain a sync between the different, uh, you know, environments. And also some of the, like, main, uh, like, main from developers or experienced main frame developers are either leaving or retiring and new people are coming in, so how to, you know, replace them with a, uh, to understand the, the business functionality of the existing applications. It's really difficult, so. And also, like, uh, you know, the impact analysis of, you know, making a change in one part of the application since the application is so complex. So uh, if you make, you know, change in one part, then how will it affect the other parts? So so they need, like, uh, solutions for these uh, challenges. And IBM has, uh, you know, offered to, you know, you know, tackle these challenges using the rational suite of products. And uh, RDZ is one of them. And we'll be taking a look at RDZ. So RDZ is basically the integrated, uh, integrated development environment of IBM's uh, enterprise modernization workbench, which also contains a bunch of other products like uh, Rational uh, Asset Analyzer and as a Rational Team Concept for System Z. So basically, RDZ unites your ZOS resources with the desktop software, you know, for developing, maintaining, supporting, and modernizing your, uh, you know, applications. And RDZ is built upon the Eclipse platform, right? And uh, it, it's quite a comprehensive uh, package with a rich set of, uh, you know, modern development uh, capabilities. And it basically, uh, you know, 
provides you access to your assets, your assets, like you know, organizing, allocating, managing, and editing your data sets uh, using the uh, using new tools, and uh, it allows the development and maintenance uh, and support of your business applications. Uh, you know, if you want to analyze your code and you know, edit, compile, and assemble your source files. And uh, it allows you to, you know, manage and edit your unit test data as well, such as, you know, your your QSAM or uh, your VSAMs and, uh, you know, maybe your DB2 tables that you're using for testing. Uh, it provides a whole, you know, uh, set of tools inside the same development environment for, you know, working through all of these assets. And uh, it's allow, it allows easy access to your job entry subsystem for submitting jobs, you know, and viewing the output uh, from that from those jobs. So what you see over here is a screenshot of how the uh, rational network system ZID looks like, uh, and we'll be covering it in more detail uh, as we see the different features. So um, what can you do with the uh, RDC? Basically, you can develop your mainframe applications. You know, in COBOL, PL1, and C, C++, and even uh, high-level uh, assembler language as well. And uh, you can, you know, uh, write target code for your batch applications or your online application, which might be running, um, you know, on CICS or IMS. And you can um, access your DB2 tables, IMS databases, QSAM, VSAM data structures, and uh, you can access your Windows base and. Uh, AX-based uh, systems as well. So uh, basically, RDC like provides you know traditional mainframe coding and testing, as well as you know integration with the uh, latest uh, you know uh, development tools you know such as you know service enabling your uh, you know legacy applications, and it integrates with your modern languages as well such as Java. So uh, why use RDZ? Because it provides a common, you know, platform, common uh, development, integrated development environment for your, as I said, like traditional mainframe development and leading edge mainframe development, uh, um, and you know, also for cross-platform uh, development. And it allows you, uh, you know, easy to use graphical tool functionality, even for those people like who are coming from um, you know um, an ISPF let's say or TSO background who've been working on these tools for years and are really comfortable with these tools even for them um, you know RDZ is uh, not that hard to uh, you know grasp and get acquainted to and it allows uh, remote you know uh, testing debugging and deployment of your applications as well you can integrate your uh, RDZ with existing tools uh, and other IBM products and other third-party products that you already might have running on your systems. And uh, and then you can, you know, submit your, monitor your jobs, issue your commands, you know, TSO commands and execute rec scripts. And you can allocate your data sets as well and edit them as well, you know. Uh, we can, you know, uh, integrate RDZ with file manager if you have it running on your ZOF. Then you can, you know, directly edit VSAM files within the RDZ environment. So normally, I mean, all of you must be aware of uh, a normal ISPF-based development scenario. Like uh, you're working on a program, you want to compile that program. So basically, like you'll uh, first uh, edit the JCL and uh, you know, you know, submit JCL for the compilation, and then you'll have to, uh, you know, swap to SDSF to view the log. The, you know whether the job ran successfully or not, and if it didn't run successfully, then uh, you'll have to track the error message down yeah. and maybe note it down somewhere. And uh, you know, go, and then you have to swap back into this edit session, exit from there, go to your COBOL maybe if you're working on a COBOL yeah. source. But, I'm sorry. Did someone have a question? Okay. Yeah, so you'll just uh, exit back to your JCL and go to your source file. Maybe that's a COBOL file. Then you'll try to correct your code and, you know, then change the code and jump back to the JCL and, uh, again, submit the job and then see if it compiles or not. Now, uh, this whole thing has been greatly simplified by, uh, you know, RDZ, as you also see in the demo. Like in RDZ, what you'll have is uh, 
basically uh, you'll have your COBOL and GCL file, you know, open at the same time here in tabs, and uh, you can just, uh, you know, work on your COBOL file. Then you want to compile it. You'll just jump to your JCL uh, file and uh, JCL, and you know, submit it. And uh, then you'll easily be able to view the output using the JS uh, spool, which will appear in uh, one of the areas, one of the views of RDC. I'll, I, I'll uh, you know, give more details on this once we see the demo. It, it, I mean the. The point is that it's really easy to you know switch between the different types of files and view your jobs uh, you know job logs using RDZ than as compared to uh, ISPF. It's uh, less time consuming, and also like um, <coughs> uh, the syntax uh, checking capabilities of RDZ are also uh, you know really enhanced. For example, you're working on a code file over here, and uh, you know COBOL files here, and uh, you make a mistake, a syntax mistake. And what happens is it immediately, you know, highlights that line with the error, and you see a your red uh, cross over here. It says in line 35 here, and uh, you want to know what the you know, problem with this line is. Just double click that, and you'll jump to this uh, problems view over here, which will show you that uh, what uh, uh, is the problem, um, what likely could be the problem with this particular uh, statement of yours. And uh, uh, using RDZ, you can you know interactively debug your programs. Uh, if you have like uh, IBM's uh, you know debug tool present or any other debug tool present, you can uh, easily link to it using RDZ. And your load modules would uh, still be running on uh, your ZOS, and uh, you'll be switching to a new perspective of RDZ, which is uh, suited for debugging. And in the debug environment, what you will see here is that. Uh, You'll have your uh, source file open here, and uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to set up, you know, breakpoints at different places, and you'll, you'll be able to step through the program. And as you step through the program, what you will see is there's a bunch of other views present as well. There's this uh, debug view present over here, and there's this variables view here, and the outlines view. And as you step through the program, you know, you will see all of these views are changing. I mean. Uh, you see uh, one of the variables uh, has been changed, but has been cha loaded with a value. You'll see its value being changed over here. And even um, it provides the capability that you can change the uh, values of uh, your variables at runtime. <coughs> so let's say one of the values, uh, one of the variables that is yet to be changed, and you want to change it by yourself and see what, the pro what happens when the program, when the step gets executed for that particular variable. You'll be able to do that as well. And um, RDZ also offers an integrated uh, map editor for your uh, CICS BMS files and uh, IMS MFS files. And uh, you can using this editor, you can literally like you know paint the whole uh, you know map without uh, you know using minimum uh, source coding uh, as much minimum as possible. Like for example, what you able to do is that you just create a new map file, let's say for CICS, and there's this whole palette over here. From this palette, uh, you'll be able to, you know, drag and drop various fields to your uh, map. You know, you can just design the whole map graphically without uh, having to type uh, any code at all. And if you want to, you know, uh, mo modify the code by yourself, you can also always do that by switching to the source view here, and there you'll be able to work on it as you normally do. And you can also preview it. You know, once you're done, uh, you know, modifying your uh, editing your map, you want to see how it looks at runtime. So you just click the preview tab, and you'll be able to see how it looks like. And uh, yeah, uh, one of the other great features uh, offered by uh, RDZ is that uh, the ability to connect to various different data sources and uh, data and various data managers, database managers. For example, you could connect to your DB2 uh, databases using RDZ's uh, data perspective. And let's say if you have to, uh, you know, modify your test data, you know, have you have some databases, some tables in there, and you want to modify the tables. What you can do is, um, without writing any SQL queries, you can, you know, graphically edit, you know, your tables and all other database properties as well. I've, like you can see here that I've opened one of the tables over here, and I'm trying to edit it. 
So this employee table is open over here, and uh, I can you know just graphically edit it, just like in an Excel sheet. You can make your changes, and you can just save them, and it'll automatically create an SQL query and submit to the database for the changes to be made. And uh, of course, uh, <coughs> RDV offers uh, you know generation of web services as well uh, as part of its uh, SOA offering. And uh, what you can do is you can take your existing applications, whether they be Gopal or PL1 applications, and you can generate web services out of them. And you can, uh, you know, how you can generate a web file for you, that you can, you know, um, it's going to be deployed, and you can call that web service from anywhere. And this, you can use this, uh, you know, if you, you want to modernize, your, if you want to, let's say, webify your, you know, client interfaces. You can do that easily using web services. You can design your uh, modern-looking web pages, and you know, uh, call um, use your existing business logic, which might be uh, see, uh, might be a CICS online application, and retrieve the data from that using uh, RDZ's generated web service. So, like, how can you sell um, RDZ to your own organization? Because it it, it reduces training costs, especially for the and your younger people coming in, uh, who are more acquainted with Windows-based, you know, graphical tools. So it's easy to train them on, you know, uh, modern uh, integrated development environment as compared to uh, uh, command line-based and panel-based tools. And it, it obviously increases your productivity because uh, there's a whole lot uh, less number of, you know, uh, keystrokes that you have to perform. Among other things as well, for example, the, the enhanced uh, syntax checking and uh, ability to uh, you know manipulate your databases without uh, you know using uh, you, you don't have to use tools like Spoofy, and you know you can just graphically edit your data, and you can you can work offline as well. You can uh, you know download some uh, source files that you're working on to your local host uh, to your workstation and you know, work on them and not be connected <coughs> to uh, you know your mainframe and yeah and one of the features uh, that I probably uh, missed to mention was that uh, when you're working with the data perspective you're connected to your DB2 let's say database then RDZ uses the JDBC connectivity to connect your database so that, that also saves your you know host uh, MIPS work cycles this is also you know of course high quality applications and you can maximize the reuse of your applications uh, let's say by you know so enabling some of your applications and obviously uh, as we discussed it attracts the younger developers in your organization so these are some of the features that I want to talk about so you can just summarize them quickly the RDZ is an Eclipse based uh, IDE which uh, helps in uh, speeding up mainframe program maintenance and so application development, and it's a complete, uh, you know, JWE and EGL integrated JWE and EGL development environment, right? And uh, it offers, uh, yeah, integration with source code management uh, tools as well. Most of the uh, leading like source code management tools uh, can be easily integrated with an RDC. And it uh, also includes uh, other tools like the CICS Explorer for working with CICS. And uh, traditional mainframe programs can also be developed and maintained and with increased productivity using the features that are offered by RDC. And uh, web services can be really easily developed, developed using the built-in wizards that are provided by RDC. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, your integration with uh, you know IBM and other third-party tools that you might already be using at your shop uh, that is also uh, possible with RTC. So, without uh, further ado, I should uh, jump to the demo. But let's see if there are any questions. Uh, so there is a question from Guy. Is there any support of Rex inside RDZ? Rex? Yes. Yeah. So we do have uh, Rex support within RDZ, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, if you have, if you want to discuss more on that, like, uh, uh, 
uh, we can set up a call with you to discuss about you know your requirement and after the call okay go ahead Jose, with the demo yep all right All right, so I hope everyone can see my screen. I uh, opened up the RDZ development environment. And uh, like once you first start RDZ, uh, most of these areas are blank. And uh, what I've done over here is I've just created a couple of a bunch of projects over here. So uh, once you open up RDZ, you uh, and uh, you presented with this uh, ZUS projects perspective. Now, perspective uh, in Eclipse and uh, and rational uh, IDEs is basically something which is a collection of views. Now, you can what are views? Now, you see the different different tabs over here: the remote systems and ZUS projects, outline, properties, remote error list. These are all different views which make up a perspective. You can loosely, uh, you know, link these views to your as a, you know ISPF panels, right? Uh, let's say if you have a 3.4 in ISPF, uh, there's a view corresponding to that here in RDZ as well. So a collection of different views is called perspective. This is a ZUS project's perspective, which is more optimized for development purposes. So uh, and we'll be seeing a lot of other views and perspectives later on. So. First things first, uh, first of all, you get this ID now, you have to connect to your ZOS LPAR. So what you can do that by, there's this option called New Connection. You can just uh, right click it, in fact expand it by left clicking and there's this option ZOS, you can right click it and click the New Connection. And there, you know, you can, uh, you can, uh, create your new connection you can type the host name or the IP address and the connection name whatever you want to call it let's say I want to call it RDNT and you can just click next and specify the ports that the RSC daemon is listening on for like when you install the first of all you have to install your uh, RDZ listener on your ZOS and after that listener has been installed and configured, then you are able to, you know, connect to your ZOS using this uh, client, RDZ client. So I'll just click finish here, and this uh, connection will be created. As you can see over here, the RDT connection has been created. Now, once uh, this connection has been created, you need to log on. And as you would log on using, you know, let's say ISPF. So if you just right-click this connection over here, you see a whole bunch of options here. So I'm going to use the connect option over here, and uh, I can use uh, any ID, which I, I can use my own ID. Oops. All right, so as you can see over here, uh, it, has, it has connected now. Now you see a bunch of options here, ZOS Unix files, ZOS Unix shells, MBS files, DSO commands, and JES. Now it conveniently you know, puts together uh, everything for you in one single place. Now let's, go, let's compare this to uh, your terminal-based environment. If you have to, like, you know, jump from uh, MBS to the Unix SS or from um, you know from SDSF to uh, your uh, from ISPF to SDSF you know but all of these are present here in the same place for example if I expand my MVS files so what it does is the user ID that I use to log on to the system it takes that user ID as an HLQ and fetches all the data sets that are related to that particular user ID so my um, HLQ uh, related to my ID was user so it has fetched all the data sets related to my HLQ work here. Now you can you can you can have, you can do a side by side, you know, and a comparison with ISPF over here. I mean, if you want to do the same thing on ISPF, what you would do, you have to probably do a 3.4, and uh, you know, search for this HLQ, and if 
there's a large number of uh, data sets returned, then you might need to uh, scroll through different, uh, you know, um, screens as well. But here, uh, all the possible, uh, you know, all the data sets related to this particular HOQ are listed in one convenient place. So what are you seeing? What you're seeing over here is uh, our data sets, basically. And uh, if I just click one of them, let's say user.test.cobol, If you see on the left now, <clears throat> there's a properties view. What it does is, is it basically fetches down the properties of that particular data set. It's kind of taking some time. I think it's my network connection, probably. All right. So yeah. Okay, so I've connect, uh, clicked this particular data set, user.test.cobol, and on the left you see in the properties view are all the attributes and information about this particular data set. It's block size, the DSN type, organization, everything is presented, presented here conveniently in a view side by side. Now just, again, you know, compare this with ISPF. If you want to check the information about a particular data set, you'd probably have to switch to another menu and, you know, check out the details for that particular data set. And if you want to jump from other, one data set to other data set, you're going to have to switch to that data set again. But here, you just click the, any other data set, and you get the properties for that data set instantly here in this left side properties view, right? And OK. And we talked about how you can um, you know, allocate different uh, data sets as well using RDC. So it's also a point and click uh, you know, exercise. Uh, if I just right click here on MVS files and go to the new context menu, and there I see a bunch of options, you know, the filter and define generation data group, allocate a partition data set or a sequential data set, or even a VSUM file. Now, if I use this option, allocate uh, PDS, and it's going to ask me a couple of uh, questions. Here's that name, the HLQ that I want. I can type any qualifiers here. I'll click Next. And then it asks me, like, uh, what category does it belong to? Is it a, is it a source data set? And if yes, then what type is it? Maybe. I'll say it will contain COBOL files. So I'll select the type as COBOL, I'll click Next. And then you can, you know, the, 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 the usual uh, characteristics that you put on for, creating, for allocating a data set, the volume serial, the space units, and the quantity, and the you know, record format, and everything. You can even use SMS if your system uh, has been configured to work with it. You just click this button, and you can put in the SMS characteristics. And if you just click the Finish button, it will be created. Now, uh, in the MVS file you're seeing over here is that it's fetched automatically the data sets belonging to my HOQ. But uh, what if you say that I want to see some other data sets as well, data sets that belong to some other HOQ. So that is also possible. What you can do is you can create filters. If I just right click this. Uh, MVS files and go to new. There's an option called filter. I'll click this and I can tie and name this filter as anything I want. Let's say I want to access the files, uh, access the data sets belonging to some other user. Obviously, if I have the you know authorization to access those, only then I'll be able to do so. So I just call this uh, filter as uh, another user. Let's say it's Geo and click next. Now I have to uh, you know give him the filter name. In fact, filter string, I'll give shadil dot asterisk that to bring everything that has an HOQ of shadil, the next, and then I can just give it any name that I want. And click next and click finish. So now what you'll see over here is another filter created by the name of shadil, and if I expand it. It'll show me the data sets belonging to this particular user if I have the authority to access them, right? So in this way, you can you know uh, list down 
any any data set that you want, right? And using custom uh, uh, filter strings. All right. So this is the remote uh, view, and uh, this is the local view. Basically, this view is project view where you can create a new project and. Uh, So I call it um, RC, and let's say it's an MVS project. Now it asks me for a bunch of uh, properties. I'll have to associate a property group to this project. We'll, I'll come to this in a bit, the property groups. I'll click finish and the project is created, a local project. Now, uh, this resides on my workstation, the local machine. And uh, uh, what I can do is I can do, I can drag and drop files from, you know, uh, my remote systems to my local project and vice versa. Let's say if there's, there's some files that I, uh, you know, want to work on, uh, maybe offline. I, I don't want to connect to my mainframe for that. Let's say there's a bunch of uh, COBOL files that I'm working on. So what I can do is um, I'll pick up this data set of mine and I can just uh, you know, drag it here to my local project. And there you see it. It's here right now. But as, soon, uh, as long as we're connected to the mainframe, any changes that I do to my local file will be instantly synchronized to my uh, you know, mainframe files. So if you like uh, work offline, you're not connected, then you can save uh, you know some some of your uh, work cycles on the mainframe as well. All right, so we're talking about uh, some of the you know uh, syntax highlighting properties uh, facilities offered by uh, RDZ. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up one of the COBOL files. I've got a bunch of uh, you know connections created over here, in different systems. I'm just looking for a good COBOL file. Okay, so I've just double clicked this COBOL file and uh, it's opened up here in the editor. Now you might be wondering that, uh, okay, uh, these are basically the members inside the data set, but you might be wondering that uh, how did it depend this uh, .cbl extension here? Because uh, if you're working on the un in ISPF, you normally wouldn't find that. So RDZ basically manages this using the, you know, the file system mappings. You see what I've done is I've just clicked this tab over here. This is another view, basically. This is U.S. file system mapping. What it does is that uh, it maps your uh, members on the U.S. to your uh, workstation files. You know the files that you're working on locally on, basically. You double click this file; it got downloaded uh, to maybe a temporary storage here on your workstation, and you're working on it. So once it's downloaded to your workstation, then how should uh, you know, RDZ recognize recognize it. You know, uh, is it a COBOL file or is it a JCL? You know, uh, is it an assemble assembler file? Right. So what it does is, is um, there's some you know mapping criteria that are that are defined over here, as you can see over here. That uh, if there's a mapping criteria of dot load, it maps to exe, and COBOL maps to you know CBL. Right, and uh, it's just the way that you know uh, how you you know uh, create your data sets over here. So it recognizes this file correctly as a COBOL file, and it's open over here. And there's some highlighting also that's uh, you know uh, done by RDZ. 
and, you know, colors like uh, green and uh, blue for and uh, black, you know, for comments and, you know, literal, etc. And uh, let's say if you work through your, uh, if I go back to this uh, left-hand side, there is this outline view. Now what this view does is that does is that it conveniently allows you to study the structure of your whole program. You know, if you've got a relatively large program file, and it, it allows you easily to jump between the different sections or parts of the program, right, without having to scroll through the whole program. Let's say I've got this program that's got like 500 lines. You could have program, programs with thousands of lines. But uh, in this case, uh, I've got this program. Now, I've, I've come to this outline view, and I can see all the divisions here. If I just click one of the divisions, what you see on the right is that my cursor jumps to that exact place. I click the environment division, and it you know, jumps to the start of the environment division over here. And similarly, I click the data division. Wherever it might be located in the program, it will just jump there directly, as you can see over here. And similarly, for procedures, I'll click the procedure division, and it jumps right there. Now, that's not all. I mean. Uh, if I go back to the data division, I see that it can be expanded into the working storage section and the linkage section. Now, even these are expandable. I expand the working storage section, and I can I can jump to any and say, you know, declaration or variable I want. And let's say I always want to check this one out. I'll just click this one, and it'll take me directly there. You know, if you want to have a record over here and and you, you don't have to manually, you know, scroll through the file and search for that particular record. You can instantly jump to it using the, uh, you know, outline view. So that's that's pretty convenient and you know saves you a lot of time, especially you know if you are let's say working on a new program and trying to understand the program. And there's a whole lot of other lot of other options present inside this editor. It's called the Alpex editor here. Uh, for example. If I, I can just uh, do a lot of stuff, I can select a bunch of uh, lines over here and perform operations on these lines as well. I've selected these two lines with my mouse over here, and I can right click here, and now what I see is the context menu. I mean, this menu will change depending upon the file that you're working on. It will be different, slightly different for a COBOL file than to uh, a JCL, and you know, and similarly for others. So I could I right clicked here, and I see this option source. There's this option comment. So if I click this thing, it's going to comment out these two lines. You know, so you don't have to manually you know comment out uh, the any of the lines that you want inside your code. You can always undo your changes with relative ease. You know, you can go to edit over here, and there's this option undo. There's even a shortcut, normal shortcut Control Z. Most people would be aware of that as well. So all of those standard, you know, shortcuts are also applicable over here as well as the other shortcuts that are you're normally used to working with in, in your, you know, ISPF develop uh, development environment. Those so uh, you work equally fine here as well. And um, let's say if I like uh, I make a mistake here in my you know program and. Uh, Any type of you know um, mistakes that I might accidentally make because it, what it does is it uh, on each keystroke it checks your uh, program right for any syntactical errors as well. Let's say I've removed this brace over here. So what I see is instantly shows me an exclamation mark over here and it also gives you tries to give you a pointer about what type of mistake you might have you know made it says that left parenthesis is, uh, you know is expected after this token so it's like, it gives you like really good pointers you, you might uh, really helps you you know make less mistakes when you're especially like syntax mistakes uh, when you're working all right so let's say now um, we were talking about you know how you can, you know, compile a program using, uh, you know, SDSF. You know, you have a source file. You want to compile that source file. What's the cycle back there? So let's see how we can do this here in um, RDC. 
But before that, um, let's take a quick look at uh, property groups here. It's basically, pro property groups are basically XML files, you know, that in, in which you define the, you know, the mappings of your, and the locations of your, you know, assemblers and linkers for your different source codes, like, uh, for, uh, languages, for example, COBOL and, you know, assembler and DB2 and other um, <coughs> systems are also present over there, for example. I've got a bunch of, uh, you know, you know property groups present over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open one of them. I've opened up this pro property group and if I go to COBOL, what I can see here is I can define the, you know, procedures and steps for compiling and linking my program. So you can see the procedure names over here. You must be familiar with these. And just click them, I can see the properties here as well. Relax at COC. You can see that uh, all this particular procedure is being used for a COBOL program. And uh, now, make things interesting, what REZ can do for you is if you're working on a COBOL, let's say COBOL file, you want to compile it, um, normally you would, you would have to use a JCL for the compilation. What RZ can use uh, do for you as well is that it can generate uh, basic JC, JCL for you automatically. You know, if you have defined the property group correctly, it can define, it can generate a JCL for you, which can help compile your code. Now here I've defined, uh, you know, some of the uh, other options. For example, what would be my listing output data set and my debug data set, and where will the object that uh, you know files be placed, and where will the copy lives be. You know, all the data sets have been defined here. So uh, once your, you know, JCL runs, you know, it will place the relevant, uh, you know, artifacts in these uh, data sets. So let's open up a COBOL program and uh, see how we can uh, generate a JCL for that. Okay, we've got a simple program here. And uh, now I want to generate a JCL. Now there's uh, three options here. You can either just compile it, or you can compile and link edit it, or you can just compile. Or you can li compile, link edit, and uh, you know run the program as well. So in this particular, uh, I've got the source code. I want to generate the JCL. What I can do is I can right-click this uh, source code file over here, and there's this option over here: generate JCL. And when I hover over this, I get three other options. Do I just want to compile it, or do I want to compile and link edit it, or do I also want to run it when it's since done uh, compiling and link editing? So let's say if I want to compile, link, and go. So once I click this option, you know, it asks me that, uh, that the JCO, the member name that will be created, what do you want to call that as? So I figured that uh, let's called same, add new, and uh, what will be the JCL data set name? Now, now you see it automatically picks up the data set name that we define in the property group. We want our JCL to go inside this uh, particular data set. So I'm just going to click OK. Now it says that uh, the member by this particular name already exists. I just want to, I'll just replace it. And then it says the JCL generation is complete. So do I want to take a look at that JCL? Yes, I do. So I'm going to just click open. And here's my JCL. Right. The job has been generated. And now I can do is that uh, I can submit this job as well. What I can do is within the JCL, if you want to modify the JCL, you know, by any means, you can do that as well. And once you're done modifying it, it just generates a base for you. you just right-click within this JCL area, and there's this option called Submit. And uh, once you submit it, you'll see something over here, which you also see in ISPF, the job ID. They've got a 434. Now, how to see the job output? Now, if you remember, once when you created the connection, 
we got this JES option over here as well. So I'm just going to expand this JES and expand the My Jobs section. And it's going to automatically retrieve all the jobs related to My User ID. So you can see this job over here, 434 is present over here. I can just uh, double click at first to see the whole spool. Now, uh, I think you can appreciate this, that in the same place I've got all the three files open. I've got my COBOL file here. I can switch between them with relative ease. I've got my JCL. I've got my spool. And let's say if I've got any errors in this generation, right, uh, I can, uh, you know, track those errors and then, you know, just come back to my COBOL program, make the changes, right, save it, and just right click from here, again generate the JCL, which will replace this JCL, and then run the JCL again. And it'll show me the output. In this particular case, uh, it seems that our job just ran fine because we're getting a written code zero. So, uh, and we're getting a small hello world message over here as well. So, I mean, just uh, compare this with oh, what you would normally do in a in an ISPF based uh, environment, you know, it, it definitely takes uh, a lot less time, you know, to switch you know, back and forth between different uh, source code and jobs and, you know, spool files. Right. Uh, having done this, now, uh, as you talked about uh, the different, uh, you know, perspectives. This perspective is a ZS projects perspective, and we've got a bunch of uh, other uh, perspectives as well. Now, remember we talked about uh, the data perspective where you can connect your, you know, data bases as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to an entirely different perspective. Now, what you can do is you can just click this window menu item and go to open perspective, and uh, from here you've got a few options over here. From here, we can pick data, and what you can see over here is that something has changed. You know, um, some of the views that we were previously seeing, we're not seeing them anymore. Now we've got a whole bunch of new views over here, which are you know are related to working with databases. So when you first time you know switch to this view. I'm getting a bunch of uh, connections over here, but you obviously have no connections. So what you can do is you can go to database, database connections. You can right click here in new, and here you can you know define a connection to your database uh, manager. Let's say I have DB2 for ZOS, and uh, you can just select this option, and then you have to type the location, right? Whatever the location I'm using. Let's see, I have this one. This is actually a database running on uh, for unit test systems. So I'm, I'm just supplying in some of the required uh, parameters. And once I'm done uh, providing those parameters, you can see the connection URL. Now this is all done using JDBC. So it's using JDBC to connect to your database. So you can definitely save your work cycle here as well. Now I'm going to put this test connection over here. And if everything is provided uh, correctly, then the connection will succeed. And we get a notification here. I click OK. I can just click Finish from here. All right. So since I already had uh, one connection, I've got this other connection as well. It's renamed to Dallas 91 because I already had one connection named Dallas 9. Now, this is my database. I can expand it. You know, I can manipulate my whole database here using these uh, graphical-based tools, and without having to write minimum, uh, you know, queries. So I'm expanding the schemas here. All the schemas are present here. I can just uh, expand one of them, and I could go to one of 
take a look at one of the tables here. There are the different tables here. Let's take this table. Now, what you can do is, you say, I've got my test data in here, and I just want to modify some of it. You know, so you can just right-click it. There's this data option, and there's an option called Edit. Click this option, and you get the whole, you know, contents of this table here in this uh, editor over here. Now, this editor resembles, uh, you know, maybe an, uh, a spreadsheet file, you know, or Excel edit. Excel window where you can you know just double click any item in a cell to change it. Now I can make any change. I can just hit the enter key, changes it there. And now if I want to just change, save my changes, I'm going to click the save button. What's going to happen is once I click the save button, it's going to generate some query, some SQL code, and it's going to submit that code. So what you see is it has been saved, but I get a message over here. Uh, this whole query has been created automatically and it says that it has updated one row. So without having to write any SQL code, uh, you know, you can uh, do a whole lot of uh, stuff with your databases. But you can also use your custom queries as well and store procedures and there's a whole lot of stuff that can be done. Uh, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm just going to switch to the next item, which is related to debugging. So Now, this is the uh, perspective about data. Now, debugging has its own perspective. All right, so this was the data perspective. Now we want to see some debugging, how it's done. It's going to quickly show the window is about debugging. I'm going to change the perspective. I'm going to go to window, open perspective, but I don't see any debugging perspective here. So there's this other option that I'm going to click, and there's a complete list of perspectives that I can select from. So uh, I've got this debug perspective, which I can click OK. Now, once I do this, you see that the views have again changed completely. Now, you've got a couple of new, uh, you know, tabs over here, which is the debug tab, variables, breakpoints, outline here. It's not new. And uh, so I'm just going to quickly show, I mean, how it works. We might not have actually the time to go through it. Let's say if you have a you know source file present here, just like as we discussed in the you know presentation, uh, you'll, you'll have a source file here, and you'll have a JCL for that file, which will be running. It will be using the compiling Go, but you'll have to add a few parameters to your JCL to invoke the debugger. Now, this debugger needs to be you know uh, integrated with any debugging uh, product that you're using on your mainframe. Let's say IBM Debug Two. And once you run your JCO, it'll allow you to step through your program. You'll be able to assign breakpoints here, and as as you step through your program, you'll be able to see how the variables change in this area, and how the outline is. You know, uh, it's getting through the outline uh, step by step. You know, and you'll be able to make changes to your variables and how the breakpoints are changing. You'll be able to see everything over here. And uh, Similarly, uh, we talked about uh, you know web service generation using RDC. I'm, I'm kind of I'm really sorry that I read through these slides. We're running out of time. So uh, there's just another perspective called the uh, enterprise service tools, which can help you in generating web services. Uh, what you can do is that you'll have to create um, one of the ways of, you know, let's say there's a scenario that you have a CICS uh, application and, uh, you know, you, you want to web enable that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, particular application. 
you might want to design some web-based interfaces, maybe in Java or .NET, and uh, you you say, all right, uh, can we have a web service that can, you know, <clears throat> extract data using this uh, existing CI/CD application? What you can do is using this uh, EST Project Explorer, you can create a new project, a service flow project. Now I'm not going to really go into the details because I just have a minute left. And you can just create a project over here. And what happens is when you create the project, like have this project over here, you have to define a bunch of uh, you know um, things over here. For example, you have to import, let's say, which particular BMS files are part of your you know programs or applications. So you'll have to import your BMS files here. And once you're done, uh, you'll have to record a whole flow, right, uh, on the on the whole screen. Let's say if I have a host connection. I'll have to create a host connection and then once that uh, connection has been created, I'll have to record my interactions with the screen. For example, if you can see, I'm just trying to connect. All right, this one is working. So what you're going to have to do is, um, let's say, I go to Kex and uh, say this is one of the screens. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to I'm going to have to record my whole flow. So there's this recording option. Using this recording option, I have to record the flow, and then we'll generate the recording. And using that, uh, you know, uh, gener uh, generated artifacts, you'll be able to supply in a few more parameters, and you know, then generate the visual files, which will be deployed and then can be easily consumed. I'm really sorry that I have to rush through this, as I'm almost out of time. So this is uh, mostly it about the demo, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to have to switch to all. Sayed. Yeah, sure. I'm going to unmute all, like, if you have any questions. Like, I see one question from Sam. Uh, Jose, like, when you develop offline, do you need recompile when you move the code to host? Yes. Uh, I have unmuted all. Like, uh, user, like there is a question, like from yeah. Sam. Yes, yes. Yep. Yes, yes. That will be needed actually. Okay. Well, is there any other questions? You when, uh, Saeed, when when you think about it, it makes perfectly good sense. As as you're moving um, your developed work into the higher levels of testing, you're going to want to be at the same level of compiler and, and other such things. Uh, so that everything's in sync. So you don't want to move your binaries up. But the notion of when you move binaries and when you recompile um, is largely and a depends how they do it kind of conversation. Yeah. Got it. And, and obviously, like uh, your object modules and uh, object decks and modules, stored modules, they only reside on the remote system. You can't move them so on the local side. Right. But even on the host system, as you promote from say, um, QA to pilot to whatever, the, the customers vary in terms of when they move the binaries forward and when they rebuild. And it often has something yeah. to do with what levels of compilers are they using for that level of the application. Yeah. There is another question like from Sam. Can you debug stored procedures written for DB2? That can be done. Okay, so that, that is possible through our uh, RDB sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a commonly questions? asked question, but yes, it, it is there. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to make myself as a presenter very quickly, like uh, what offerings we give from, you know, like uh, uh, from the services perspective. Like we have, I mean, like a jumpstart services, like a four weeks package. Week one, like we do installation of RDZ and configuration. Week two, week two, we help in customizing as per your business. I mean, like setting up RDZ as per your business needs. Uh, week three and four, we can do mentoring and you know training 
and uh, make your uh, developers up to come up to the speed. And also, like we help in, I mean, like you know, uh, sizing and licensing, help you in terms of like you know, like uh, getting the RDZ in terms of uh, licensing cost. And we offer, I mean, like a two hours uh, complimentary, you know, like a webinar session for your developers. So if you need, I mean, like you know, this complimentary session, we can have a one-to-one -one meeting, and you know, we can uh, give this session uh, to all your developers and make sure that they they learn RDZ, you know, uh, completely. Okay. Is there any questions? Like, uh, if you need any help, I mean, like you can send emails to us. Hope you have all our contact details. You can send uh, email to info at royalcyber.com. And I think like uh, uh, we will, I mean, like you know, contact you for any help you want. Okay. Is there any other questions? Excellent. Thanks a lot for, I mean, like your time today. It was a very good webinar. Thanks a lot, and uh, please let us know if you need any help. And have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.